Hello and welcome to this latest uh, video in our new video series featuring this 1964 Mercedes 230SL. Now, if you watched our intro video on YouTube, you'll see how the car drove as we received it. It's got a small block Ford V8 in it. It's, uh, it's pumped and this thing is a beast. You can't hardly drive the thing smoothly. It just uh, it has all sorts of little quirks because it's been kind of converted. And uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of fun, but as a daily driver, I think it'd be more of a headache. Might be a fun car to go out cruise once in a while, but, but we're going to convert it to electric. And it's not only going to be quick, but it's going to be smooth, quiet, simple, reliable, and just make this car a very enjoyable driver every day. In So today we're going to talk about a few of the considerations as we prepare to convert this car. Right now I've got it up on rollers so the car sits a little higher than it, than it does normally. Um, we just have it on rollers right now so we can move around easily. But that doesn't matter for, for video purposes. I just wanted to let you know since it is sitting up much higher than it than it normally does. So anyway, one of the first things that we do when it's on the ground is we will measure the ride height. We'll take fixed points on the vehicle that you know aren't affected by uh, the conversion. So anywhere on the body, basically, but somewhere where we have a good a good line, uh, a good reference point on all four corners. And we measure the ride height in all four corners prior to conversion. And uh, now if the vehicle doesn't have an engine in it, uh, then that's a little different ball game. But this has, you know, it's, it's a operating vehicle. And it has a nice stance to it currently. And so it's sprung to handle that V8 under the hood. And so it will be able to handle some, uh, you know, what we put under the hood, replicating that weight. And so we do that by, you know, calculation and estimation on what the things weigh that we remove and what they weigh, the replacement items weigh. And the ultimate goal is to replicate the original stance, to put the weight, not only so the stance 
is replicated, but to put the weight in areas that the car was originally designed to carry weight. So we're not gonna put all the batteries back in the trunk. This is a two-door convertible. It wasn't designed to have a lot of weight in the back end of the car. It was designed to have most of the weight right here over the front axle and behind the front axle. As was seen, I don't know if it'll show up in this camera shot, but you can see this is the front axle right here and the middle of the engine is about right here. So about six or eight inches behind the axle center. And of course you've got the transmission which will stay in place, won't be affected by our conversion. So anyway, we want to make sure that we put the weight in the same place. We don't want to put a bunch of batteries out here in front of the axle. We don't want to put a bunch of batteries behind the rear axle. So based on space and so forth, uh, we have to figure all that out. And so that's one of the things that we do at this point is we kind of look at things, we take a lot of pictures, and we get a feel for the car, both the top side and the bottom side. We're taking a look at where things are, where we can run cabling if need be and so forth. So we have a big picture view. Then with that big picture view, we will, you know, condense it down to what is appropriate for this vehicle. For instance, based on the range requirements from the customer, this is going to feature 50 180 amp hour uh, cal cells. And so that takes up a little bit of volume and that presents a little bit of weight. And so we're going to have to calculate that in. So in doing this, you know, like I said, the big picture is very important to have that understanding because we have to figure out both volume and weight wise where to place things, but also aesthetically um, and also for potential maintenance or replacement. So you can't just stash something anywhere because that may come back to haunt you later on. So all these things have to be considered. So where we are now is we took our, our uh, ride height measurements. We've taken a lot of pictures. We've inspected the underside. And so uh, one of the next things will be to remove the hood Currently, there's no prop to hold the hood open. And even if there was, uh, we're gonna have to remove the hood to pull out the engine. So, next step will be removing the hood, getting that out of the way, wrapping it up, putting it in storage. And then we're gonna start disassembling parts that aren't needed. And so, first thing that's gonna go will be the exhaust. We'll uh, after inspecting underneath, this exhaust is all bolted together, so we can remove sections by unbolting. We're not going to have to do a bunch of cutting. So that part's nice. Uh, and then, you know, the, the radiator and fan will be, you know, drained and removed. Uh, we'll take a look and see if the headers need to be removed or if we can come out with those in place. But that's where we are. That's, we're preparing to remove the engine. But before we did that, like I said, we wanted to take and do that overview, take photos, look at where the motor mounts are, because we're going to be using those motor mounts to mount our electric motor. And so look to see where the auxiliary battery is going to go. It doesn't have a nice battery mount right now. The battery's just sitting on a piece of wood floating around up there. We put a bungee cord just to kind of hold it in place so we could test drive the car. And that brings another point, the test drive. We're checking to make sure all systems work. I mean, in the shop, we test to make sure the lights and all that work. Uh, we test the brakes and everything. Uh, 
in the shop before we get out in the parking lot. And we get familiar with all the little idiosyncrasies of the car. And especially something like a 1964, they can have quite the personality. This one uh, has a hydraulic clutch, um, but it's obviously out of adjustment. The clutch never really feels like it fully disengages. It's, it, 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 it's fully engaged, barely off the floor. Um, the brakes seem to work okay, have plenty of braking power, but you've got a lot of pedal throw before they come into play. The steering is very light, it steers very, very easily, but it has terrible turning radius. I mean, I can turn my long bed, extra cab, four wheel drive, Dodge pickup in the same circle as this thing will turn. Yeah, terrible turning radius. Uh, the throttle has some issues, and I think that's probably just the way it's routed going to this carburetor and the springs and so forth. I don't think that's going to uh, transfer over to the conversion. So, you know, we want to know these things. I want to know, you know, how the shocks feel, how the brakes and steering and, and the transmission and the rear end, are there any noises uh, that would, you know, be a flag that something else is uh, uh, going to be a problem? Well, we've learned in the past, uh, you know, the engine noise hides some things, but best we can tell, uh, you know, the, the running gear on this seems to be real good. It seems to handle the horsepower of this uh, beast of a V8. So I don't think we're gonna have any issues there. We'll take a look at the clutch and flywheel once the engine's removed, since we will be retaining those in the conversion. Um, it has a five-speed gearbox. Um, I don't know what the rear end gear ratios are or anything. I'm guessing it's probably all stock. And so we can get that information. Um, so beyond, you know, lots of photographs, like when we take our measuring points, we take notes of where that measuring point was on each of the corners. Um, we take a photograph of that, so we have a written description and a photographic description. Let's see, what else can I uh, tell you about? Well, I think that's it. It's just going to be to systematically remove the internal combustion components. We'll remove the engine and everything first. We're going to pull the fuse on the electric fuel pump so that if the key is turned on for whatever reason, uh, shouldn't be after this point, but just to make sure that we're not pumping fuel out on the shop floor. Um, but after the engine's out of the way, we will um, use the electric fuel pump to help drain the fuel tank. And then uh, once that's done, will remove the electric fuel pump, which is in the back here near the, near the tank. Not in the tank, but near the tank. And then there's just, looks like three bolts that hold the fuel tank in place and we'll drop the fuel tank. Uh, the fuel tank is underneath the uh, trunk and it's, you know, it doesn't hang down or anything. Actually, the, the spare tire well is the lowest point uh, on the, uh, vehicle other than the exhaust and uh, the oversized oil pan and everything. Um, we're simply removing that just to help lighten this car. This Mercedes is not a light car. This, even this little two-door uh, convertible, I mean, it's got thick doors. And convertibles tend to be a little heavier anyway. They, they need a little more structural uh, rigidity to make up for the fact they don't have that top. So weight is important. The owner wants as much range as possible. And so we're going to you know, remove the tank. Not that anyone would have ever noticed it's there or not there, like I said. It's just to drop the weight. And so um, we typically get rid of the spare tire. When you have a car that's only going to have a 100 mile range, 
um, you know, carrying the spare, you know, I, I have had a flat tire on an electric vehicle, uh, had a road hazard uh, that was flicked up by another car, hit the back end of my Carmen Ghia and uh, tore a hole in the sidewall. Um, you know, I've got the spare at the shop. I could have called somebody to come get me and, and uh, take me to the shop, get the spare everything. Instead, it was late in the day. I just called the tow truck, had him tow me home, dropped it off. I took care of it later. Um, and so, you know, not a big deal. Uh, had I had a spare on board, yeah, I would have just changed it right then. Would have been less of a hassle factor. But carrying that extra 40 pounds or whatever, you know, by getting rid of the jack, getting rid of the, the spare, it will make a difference on your range. And so this one, you know, it would be up to the owner. I would recommend get rid of, it's a heavy jack, get rid of the jack, get rid of the spare tire. Not necessary in my mind, especially if you're a person that's not gonna change your own tire. So, um, removable hard top. I'm guessing that weighs Probably it's got a lot of glass in it. It's probably 100 pounds right there. So um, it's like getting rid of the driver, uh, the average driver weight, by removing the hard top, the spare, and the jack, boom. So if you do the calculations, if you watch some of our view videos on calculating range, you'll see that that 100 pounds makes a difference. So I was getting ready to uh, pull the fuse for the fuel pump. And this is the, uh, the cover right here. One of the screws was missing, but I happen to see it laying down there. So replace that. Inside the cover here, there is uh, both in English and German, the legend of what's what, fuse number four is going to be the fuel pump. So we'll pull that. But I just want you to see what this looks like. So let me zoom in. This fuse block looks terrible. I mean, nasty. So we'll probably go through and and uh, replace the fuses and clean things up right there. Even though we're not gonna to be touching that fuse block, other than we're gonna take one 12 volt signal off of one of those switched circuits so that when you turn on the ignition, that will then activate a, a relay, which will then power um, directly from the battery through that relay all of our conversion circuits and we've talked about that in other videos and we'll be going through that again in this video series but just wanted to show that to you so uh, it looks like number four is the red fuse right there that operates the electric fuel pump we'll just pull that one and turn on the ignition and verify that that is the electric as fuel pump. with most automotive jobs first thing we're going to do is we're going to remove the negative battery terminal So that when removing the hood or whatever, pulling out that fuse, anything we do, we don't have to worry about, you know, shorting something out. So that's like job number one. So now we've marked the hood so that we can put it back in exactly the same location. We have it secured so that we can unbolt the four bolts that hold this thing to the hinges. We've got a pad between the grill and the hood and everything so that uh, nothing gets scratched and we'll now carefully remove the hood. Now, we always label everything that, you know, as we take it apart. So a lot of times we'll put things like this nuts and bolts and so forth in a Ziploc bag 
and it's labeled. But then in instances like this, where we can just put the back in the original hole kind of thing, uh, we'll do that too. That makes it even easier to find. You don't have to look through Ziploc, labeled Ziploc bags. It's right there. So now we'll wrap this hood and put it in storage out of the way. So once we've removed the hood, we remove the battery, we uh, are now removing connections to the engine. So we'll be draining the radiator um, and disconnecting the hoses, pull the radiator out. Um, we'll be disconnecting things like the throttle and vacuum lines, ignition lines, other items that are attached to the engine that need to be removed in order to remove the engine. This is, you know, easy as, you know, cars go. I mean, the radiator sits right here. <laughs> it's got, uh, oh, it looks like four bolts holding it in place, a couple hoses, a couple wires going to the, uh, the fan, and that'll be out of the way. which will allow the engine to come forward. And so it looks like we have room to come forward. And so we're gonna leave all the accessories on the front. And so we just need to come forward enough to clear the, the splines on the transmission input shaft. And uh, once we come forward, we'll jog that way just a hair to clear the booster. And I think she'll be, uh, she'll be free and clear. Now, before we do that, you know, once we have everything disconnected and we have a clearer view of things, then we're going to take some measurements. And we're going to take measurements on the transmission placement. And that would be relative to like the frame, not the ground, because that's going to change as we remove the weight. But we want to know where that transmission is located vertically as well as from side to side, because we want to replicate that so that the drivetrain, the drive shaft, and everything all is in the same line that it is currently. So we're going to continue to remove, uh, like I said, uh, all the connections to the engine. And uh, once we got everything done up here, we'll remove the exhaust. Uh, these headers, I think are gonna have to come off to get out of here, but I'll look at that closer and, um, and move forward. What a hassle. The starter motor is held on by two bolts. And the upper one was easy. The lower one was very, very difficult to get to. Had to use two different tools to finesse the thing out. And it fought me all the way. And uh, <laughs> what, what a chore. Anyway, a thought occurred to me. This one component out of hundreds on that internal combustion powered vehicle. This one component has more moving parts than the propulsion system in my electric cars. This is starting motor. It has a mechanism on here so that when it energizes, it flings this um, gear into the flywheel. And so one moving part to multiple moving parts. And it's basically the same thing. It's an electric motor. So you can see the advantage of going to electric, just something like this. This hangs down off of the 
bottom corner of the, uh, the engine. It's dirty, greasy, and nasty. I mean, it was a nasty job getting it and exhaust out. Uh, that was underneath the car too. Underneath, it's a little dirty. And uh, so, and this is, this is fairly heavy. So we're gonna lose a bunch of weight. We're gonna lose a bunch of moving parts that fail, and do fail. And uh, so we're moving the right direction. It's just kind of hard, dirty work, and I'm looking forward to doing the, the uh, conversion part where I don't get my hands so dirty. Here's what's been removed from the car so far. We've got the exhaust, the radiator, the starter, and uh, one header. Let's go take a look at the car. So here's the engine compartment view. We removed the header on this side, which aided in the removal of the starter motor. The battery and radiator have been removed. On this side, we still have the header because there's a bolt, a far back bolt. It's nearly impossible to get a wrench on. So, we're going to see if we can pull this out or at least get it part way out before we tackle that. So next, we need to remove the hoses from the power steering pump, you know, drain the pump, remove the hoses, plug those off. We need to, rem to support the transmission. There's uh, the bolts that go, that mount the engine to the bell housing. Uh, but before we get to there, we'll hook the cradle up to the engine with the hoist in place. Like I said, secure the transmission before we start unbolting things. There's also the engine mounts that will need to be a couple bolts from those to be removed and get a better view, I think, on this side. And so, we'll tackle that. Homemade motor mount where it connects to the engine block there. So anyway, That's what's left to be done uh, on this end of the car. The other thing that needs to be taken care of now is removal of the fuel tank, and that will be the last thing that we do. And then, uh, then start prepping for the uh, conversion components. We'll clean the engine compartment and so forth and get it ready. Well, we've got the beast out of the car. What a job. This thing was tight. I'm telling you. And uh, so, it was quite the job. Uh, a, a fraction of an inch at a time, massage this thing out of the car. So we'll take a look at the uh, engine compartment and the transmission and give you an idea just how tight this was. All right, here's the engine bay where that engine used to reside. They had some spacers that fit on top of the mounts right there that were just loose spacers, so they're not sitting there right now. There's the bell housing. Now, I want you to see how close that is to the firewall. And then look how close it is at the bottom. So there's a steering arm that goes across here over the frame. That had to be removed. And 
I'm telling you, that was one tight fit. To clear the input shaft and to clear that we could only raise this a little bit because, because you'd hit the uh, firewall. And so, and of course with the screws loosened, and they had to be loosened a little bit as we pulled the motor away. I mean, it was just eek, eek, eek. Well, you couldn't have removed the transmission and, uh, and the engine at the same time because they don't think it would clear. The uh, engine has this sump that the cross member was right here. So this couldn't go, you know, rearward. It could only go forward, but it couldn't go forward because of your flywheel and your shield here. So, I mean, it was tight. <laughs> Not a fun one to remove. And so now we have to engineer an electric motor to fit in there. And so issues are going to be the clearance between the cross member here. Here's our center point. That will be the center point of our motor. Will the motor we were planning clear? So got a lot of measuring and calculating to do to see if this is all going to work out as desired. So those are the challenges. But uh, first challenge is, is done. We got the engine out. All that's left of the internal combustion components is the um, fuel tank. And we'll remove that another day. Now, what's next? Well, what's next is we're going to need to take a measurement like we've discussed in other videos. We need that magic number. And that magic number is the distance between here, actually not here because this has got to go, we got to take in account this, but it's going to be from the mating uh, surface of the block to this back edge of the flywheel. Okay, so mating surface of the block, back edge of the flywheel. And we'll take several measurements. You can refer to some of our other videos. Once we've taken the measurements, we'll pull off this clutch, remove the flywheel. The flywheel is needed for further specs because uh, we need to design the coupler. And so we're going to need the uh, flywheel crankshaft um, in order to do that. So we're going to remove those items right now, remove the clutch and uh, flywheel. I was measuring the magic number. I've taken it from multiple locations, but not down here where there's, you know, where it's up against the block. And the uh, consensus looks like it's an inch. So now I'm going to measure this in a couple different spots and uh, we'll have to add that dimension in, okay? Since I'm taking the reading from this side of it. The other thing to do would be pull the clutch off, pull the flywheel off, 
pull this off, and then put the flywheel back on. I'm doing it this way. Hopefully it's six of one, half dozen of the other. So I'll probably do it both ways just to double check. I'm kind of a stickler about that. So another thing we want to do is we want to mark the clutch and the flywheel. And I'll look and see if somebody, well, yep, here it is. See this yellow mark right here? They've already marked it. That way, this was balanced. And that way we know that when we reassemble this later on, that we retain that balance. It's like a fairly nice clutch. And it should be able to handle what we're putting in. So that's it for this video. Hope it wasn't uh, too dry and boring, but these are things that you need to consider uh, in the process. And this is just, you know, kind of the first steps in this process of converting from gas to electric. Thanks for watching.